Hey, everybody. Um, welcome. Good evening and welcome to the candidate forum for the 2020 District 1 San Francisco Board of Supervisors election. I'm Allison Go, the president of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, and I'm also a resident of District 1. So I'm very excited to be here with my neighbors to hear from our candidates as a voter. The League of Women Voters is a, of San Francisco is a nonpartisan political nonprofit that encourages informed and active participation in government. The League never supports or opposes candidates. However, we do take stands on issues. This year's election presents new and unprecedented challenges for voters, and we are committed to providing the resources that voters need to exercise this most fundamental right of our democracy and be assured that their votes will be counted. Please remember that you must be registered to vote by October 19th. All registered voters will be mailed a ballot in early October, and options for in-person voting will be available both early and on November 3rd please visit our website at lwvsf.org slash vote, where you will find all of the voter resources that we offer. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit organization. If you would like to support our work and free events just like this one, please become a member or donate at our website at lwvsf.org. I am now pleased to introduce Leah Edwards, our moderator for tonight. Leah currently serves as treasurer of the League of Women Voters of the United States. She previously served as president of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, and she served on our board for almost six years. Leah believes that citizens' participation in government is critical to the success of our nation and is excited to continue furthering the League's mission in creating a more perfect democracy. Professionally, Leah works in the investment management industry in San Francisco. Welcome, Leah. Thank you, Allison. And welcome to the candidates for San Francisco District 1 Board of Supervisors. The candidates will have a chance to present their views on issues affecting San Francisco and to answer questions about those issues that were submitted in advance for tonight's forum. First, I'd like to remind you of our ground rules. Responses to questions should be on the issues and policy related. Candidates are expected to be respectful of other candidates and asked to not make personal attacks on other individuals. Here are the procedures for the forum. The candidates will have the opportunity to make one minute opening and closing statements. Opening statements will be in alphabetical order by first name. Closing statements will be in reverse alphabetical order by first name. Each candidate will have one minute to answer questions. Any rebuttals may be included in the candidate's closing statement, which will be one minute. The first question will be directed to three candidates, the second question to the remaining three candidates. This process will be repeated with a rotation of the response order. Each candidate will have the opportunity to answer the same number of questions. There will be a lightning round where all candidates will be asked the same questions with the responses being yes, no, or no response. The final question will be directed to all candidates. A countdown timer will be displayed with visual indication of the remaining time for a response. Every aspect of the forum will be equally fair to all candidates. Thank you to our attendees tonight. You are in listen only mode. The question and answer and chat features are not active. Please do not use the raise hand option. This forum will be recorded and made available on our website, our YouTube channel, and on SFGov TV cable channels. You have many important decisions to make on November 3rd. Tonight's forum will give you an opportunity to learn before you vote. Now let's begin. We will start off with one minute opening statements in alphabetical order. Welcome candidates, and thank you for participating in this forum. Please introduce yourself, tell us which neighborhood you live in, why you are running, and what would be the top three priorities for your first year? And we'll start with Andrew. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, League of Women Voters of San Francisco for holding this forum um, and inviting all of us uh, to speak to you this evening. And I think is the most critical time uh, for our city and obviously our country with the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm running for District 1. Uh, I've lived in this city for 15 years in the Inner Richmond District. Um, I met I met my now fiance here, Priya, um, 
here in here in Richmond district. Um, so this neighborhood means a lot to me. Um, over the last 15 years, I've seen the city of San Francisco, but particularly our district here um, in, in the Richmond um, deal with issues when it comes to um, trash in the streets. We've seen an increase in unhoused individuals. And that's a particular concern to me as a as a as a member of the community and obviously for my fellow neighbors, particularly with the COVID-19, it's a public health and public safety um, issue um, that we need to address. Um, I'm running to make sure we can restore uh, some, some type of order in terms of cleaning up our streets, uh, making sure we adequately fund our police uh, because we do have an increase of property crime um, in our neighborhoods and ultimately, um, you know, helping our elderly, our low income families and working families to be able to have a prosperous uh, living environment. Um, so that's why I'm running for district one. Again, I appreciate you guys hosting this and I look forward to uh, hearing questions from your committee. Thank you, Andrew. Next we'll have Connie. Uh, Connie, I think you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Connie Chan and uh, I'm running for District 1 Supervisor. I'm a first generation immigrant. I came here when I was 13 years old. Um, now I'm 42. You're welcome to do the math. And my mom still live in the same rent control apartment that I grew up in in Chinatown. San Francisco has been a great home for me and my family. Today, uh, with my partner, who is a firefighter in the city, we're raising our uh, second grader. He's a seven-year-old uh, second grader at Lafayette Elementary. For the last 15 years, I have spent um, my career in public service in city government, uh, serve as an aide to board supervisors, district attorney's office uh, when uh, then district attorney was Kamala Harris and uh, City College of San Francisco and Recreation and Park Department. I'm here, I'm running because I want to use my skills and experience to close the income divide, uh, that gap in our city so that everyone can stay here and um, house safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Next we'll have David. I'm David Lee. I live in the Richmond district. I'm a San Francisco native. Um, lived most of my life in the Richmond. Went to high school uh, here in the neighborhood at Wallenberg High School. And uh, not, uh, I guess in the mid 90s, I was on the board of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco for a number of years and did these debates. So this is a, a great job you're doing, Leah, and uh, the team here that, um, and Allison in getting everybody engaged. Um, I am an educator. I teach at San Francisco State. I also work in the community colleges supporting uh, English second language programs. And I've worked to register voters through a civil rights organization uh, for many years. I'm running to one, bring BART to the Richmond district, two, to support small business, and three, to help address the homeless crisis in our district. Great, thank you very much, David. Next we'll have Marjan. Hi, good evening. I'm Marjan Philhauer. Um, I was born here in the Richmond. I grew up on the peninsula uh, 14 years ago. My husband Byron and I moved back to the Richmond, made a very conscious decision um, to buy our home in the outer Richmond um, where we now have three kids and we also live with my mother-in-law. Um, I run a small business here in the neighborhood, um, but I have 30 years experience in government at the federal, state, and local level. And I've also run um, a strategic communications firm here in San Francisco. Uh, you know, this pandemic wasn't anything any of us expected. I think running a campaign in a pandemic is not anything any of us planned for. I think the, the backdrop of the pandemic has really highlighted where we could do better as a city. I'm very concerned uh, about homelessness, uh, about housing, about supporting our local economy, meeting small business and the very delicate ecosystem between our small and larger businesses, as well as keeping our streets safe and clean. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marjan. Next we'll have Sherman. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Sherman De Silva. I live in the uh, Richmond District uh, in San Francisco. And um, I also uh, work at a store uh, in the Richmond District. Uh, and I'm running because uh, the basic things that we all see every day uh, just are not getting taken care of in our neighborhood. Uh, that means making sure that the streets are clean, 
uh, making sure that the uh, trash cans uh, are emptied, <clears throat> make sure that our medians are maintained. All these basic functions that uh, government is supposed to take care of uh, are put uh, on the back burner in, in favor of some other issues that uh, our elected officials uh, believe are more important. And I think there is nothing that's more important than making sure that the basic functions of government um, are taken care of. Uh, I'm running for supervisor because I want to make sure that the streets are clean, make sure that traffic lights are installed on those missing blocks in the neighborhood, and that we have access accessibility uh, from the uh, supervisor to its residents. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sherman. Next, we have Veronica. Good evening. My name is Veronica Shinsato, and I'm a longtime resident of the Richmond District. I'm a proud graduate of public schools here in the Richmond District. I went to Alamo Presidio in Washington. And I'm also a double dawn graduate at USF. You know, I'm a single working mom to a 10 year old who attends Lafayette Elementary and a 21 year old who attended City College of San Francisco and who benefited from Free City where he played football and baseball. I also live in a multi generation home here in the Outer Ridge with my senior parents and understand the issues, you know, seniors are having here in our district. I own a family restaurant in San Francisco, but I also have two decades of local and state government experience. And I'm running to fight for a San Francisco that works for all and not just the selective or privileged few. My priorities, economic recovery, public safety, and housing. Those are three issues that we hear about and we need to start talking about and taking it seriously this election. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Veronica. Now we will move on to our questions. So I will ask a question and then um, select three people to answer it. The first question is, what approaches do you support that encourage the building of new housing in District 1? How would you balance increasing housing density with keeping the character of the neighborhood? And the first person to answer will be Veronica. Well, thank you for that question. First, you know, I'm a huge supporter of Ms. Senator Wiener's bill to build housing in unused land. But I'm also a huge supporter, and I'm hoping this passes Senate, is the bill from Senator Beal that brings in funding for affordable housing. I think we need to hold our elected officials at the state level and the federal level to bring in funds to be able to afford to build housing here in San Francisco. The reality is San Francisco on their own can't build affordable housing and we need the state and federal level to come in. At the same time, we need to start looking at what affordable housing means to the average San Franciscans. The reality is below market rate does not mean our low wage earners, our teachers, our first responders qualify. So we need to reevaluate what market rate housing, below market rate housing is. I'm a supporter of all income levels of housing being built in San Francisco. We need all income levels of housing in San Francisco in order to build 100% affordable housing. So that's my stand right now with housing. Oh, uh, thank you, Mark. Stop button came up. Or thank you, Veronica. I apologize. Um, next, we have David. Same question. What approaches do you support that encourage the building of new housing in District 1, and how would you balance increasing housing density with keeping the character of the neighborhood? Um, I strongly believe in uh, investing in public transit and bringing BART to the Richmond. Um, I think bringing BART to the Richmond will help us uh, create uh, transit hubs that um, can increase 100% uh, affordable housing provided that local uh, community and local control is maintained. I think that's very important uh, that the community and the neighborhood um, are at the table and consent to uh, density. Uh, however, I, I do believe that the transit is really critical and we have to do transit along with uh, building affordable housing. Uh, that's why I support bringing BART to the Richmond. We passed a $3.5 billion a BART bond in 2016. There's $10 million for a study to bring BART to Richmond. It's time to start talking about it. And I think as a supervisor, that will be one of my top priorities. Great, thank you, David. Uh, next we have Marjan, same question. So I don't think um, creating homes for families and working people and maintaining the amazing character of our neighborhood are mutually exclusive things. I think that we can plan together, which is part of having a supervisor that is engaged and in the neighborhood and having these conversations, even in years that aren't election years. I do believe that we absolutely need 100% subsidized affordable housing. 
where that subsidy will come from. I think, uh, you know, I'm a realist about that. We don't have that money coming from the federal or state government. And given the kicking the can down the road mentality we've seen on housing, not just in the Richmond, but also all over San Francisco, we need to ensure that that housing is being built in an environmentally mindful way in transit corridors, in our merchant corridors, that's part of their client base, while also creating housing um, for working families that don't qualify for 100% affordable housing. And I think that's this conversation and action plan that a supervisor is very well suited to lead. Great, thank you, Marjan. Next, we will have our second question, um, which will go to the remaining three candidates. What will you do to provide more affordable housing in District 1? Do you support programs that encourage the building of more accessory dwelling units, commonly known as granny flats or in-law units? And this question will go to Andrew. Yeah, um, yeah that's a really good question. So building out more in-laws, again, that's something that you're gonna have to discuss um, with the property owner. And I do support that, but again, you have to have buy-in from the property owners um, in order to do that, and whether that's something they want to they want to have built into their properties. Again, that's something that needs to be discussed also at the local level with the other board of supervisors, and you have to come to some sort of consensus in terms of how we want to approach that. But we definitely need, obviously, more affordable housing in District One in the Richmond District. Um, one other thing, is, as an aside, is that we there are there are available in terms of affordable housing in our district, um, but some of those some of those available uh, property spaces are are being used as Airbnbs, and so that's one of the things that we probably need to look at and change. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll have Sherman. Same question. Uh, so I think uh, for housing, I think one of the things we can do is we can make it easier for people who want to build in the city um, to build. Uh, it is very expensive and uh, it adds to the cost of anything that is built in the city. Uh, reducing some of the red tape uh, would, uh, you know, just by supply and demand will, will encourage builders to build in the city. Um, I do think uh, ADUs are, um, are helpful. Uh, adds, anything that adds to the housing stock is helpful. The other uh, two aspects that I think that, um, that need to be addressed is uh, short-term rentals. I don't believe those should be allowed, uh, such as Airbnb. They should just not be allowed. When those units were uh, brought online, they were supposed to be for housing for people who live and work in San Francisco. Um, also, our colleges and universities, I think if they are going to bring in people from outside the area, uh, we should require them to build uh, um, appropriate units to house the people that they're bringing into the community. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. And then finally, we have Connie. Thank you. I definitely uh, support the development of affordable housing. And when I talk about affordable housing and 100% and affordable, it is between 0% all the way up to 120%. And that is a below poverty rate, uh, uh, up to 100, almost $160,000 annual income for a household of four. And I think that is a, a solid middle income housing that can actually house our workforce. And it's also the reason why I supported Prop A in 2019, which is a six hundred million dollars affordable housing bond and prop e affordable housing for educators and workforce that really allow us to rezone and upzone uh, for any actually public land and private land as long as they build 100 percent affordable i think we have done a lot uh, in terms of the last few years to address assessor dialing units um, the gap is though is how the incentive for land uh, for property owners to build them so we need to continue to push forward Thank you, Connie. We'll move on to our third question. How will you address the issues in the Richmond of homelessness and crime, both short term and long term? Will you prioritize expanding homeless services? And if so, which services? If not, why not? And this will be answered first by David. I do not support uh, building a navigation center in the Richmond district. However, I do support uh, extending uh, homeless services, particularly uh, mental health crisis counselors, uh, reallocating funding from the police department uh, to um, pr provide and hire more crisis counselors to address um, the, uh, uh, the mental health crisis that we find on our streets today. 
Uh, I believe that um, uh, we should provide more services rather than a police as a response to addressing homelessness. Also believe that we should be moving the homeless um, population into hotel rooms. They should be sheltered. This is a, a public health crisis. We have hotel rooms that are already paid for uh, and we should be moving uh, the homeless population from the Richmond into hotel rooms where they can be sheltered and services provided. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next, this question will be answered by Connie. I think um, that we, at this point, that homelessness is obviously um, a symptom of a problem, and that problem is lack of equity uh, for generations of working people, the lack of equity to healthcare, education, and food security and housing security. And so let's address those issues um, first, and to because the best way to solve homelessness is to prevent it from happening in the first place. However, for the existing homeless problem is that we should really make sure that our city has coordinated services to actually provide a individualized approach. Let's not just do the count of who are homeless population, but also to know who they are so that we understand their needs and help them to get their uh, feet back, you know, to land back on their feet. And I think that also that, you know, with there should be, we recently there's a report about the gap about providing permanent supportive housing for homeless and we need to do a better job with that. Great, thank you, Connie. Uh, next, let's be answered by Veronica. No, I absolutely agree that we need homeless services here in the Richmond District, but I am a supporter of a mobile navigation center here in the Richmond District. We have navigation centers now here in the city. They're expensive to build and they're expensive to maintain. So the reality is we need these services, but how do we get them to our homeless population? The reality is this is an urgent matter now. We do need to get these individuals in the hotels because it is a public health issue. But we also have to treat it with compassion, one unhoused person at a time. The rea my focus has always been on the foster youth. The reality is if we wanna end some chronic homelessness, we can start with our foster youth who are at higher percentage rate of being unhoused at the time that they turn 21. So I'm a big supporter of changing that law to 25 to give them an opportunity to finish school, to finish their college degree. But in regards to homeless services now, it's getting them in hotels. Long term, we have to look at mental health services and housing these individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, next, I'll move on to the next question for the remaining three candidates. What would you do to address substance abuse and mental health issues for San Francisco residents? We'll start with Sherman. So uh, many of our people uh, who are on the street do have uh, mental and substance abuse uh, issues. And uh, for that reason, I have supported that the first first thing that we have to do before we do anything else is we have to get people off the street. Uh, we have to have a safe place for them to go uh, so that we can tell them you can't be out on the street anymore. Uh, my suggestion is to use uh, the city garages that we already have that are owned by the city so they don't cost us more uh, and put up temporary housing, uh, temp temporary uh, type of housing in there so everybody has their own unit. And then while they're there, we can treat everybody who needs help, find out what their situation is, what do they need, and have all of our resources in one place and have all the people who need the resources in one place. And I believe that is the best use of our resources, but we cannot get a handle on how to help people when we don't have them in a place where we can, where we can uh, interact with them and help them. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. Uh, next, we'll have Marjan. So when we talk about an issue like homelessness, I think we really need to recognize the different needs of our unhoused populations because there isn't one single solution. I think we've heard a lot of that in different candidates' responses. Um, yes, the underlying housing shortage must be addressed. We need to prevent evictions and homelessness. We need to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place. We need to enforce existing laws, not criminalizing homelessness, but enforce the laws on the books about sleeping on the streets, but also being able to offer um, our unhoused residents a place to stay. We need to increase government accountability and transparency so that we are enforcing metrics to see if these programs are working and to eliminate duplicative programs. But with regard to mental illness um, and drug use, I got to tell you, 
We cannot talk about homelessness without talking the op about the opioid crisis and the fentanyl that's been on our streets for the past two years. You got to look at what's happening in the Tenderloin and what's starting to happen in the Richmond. We have to prosecute those drug dealers so they can stop killing people and it's really affecting our homeless population. Thank you, Arjan. Um, and finally, we'll have Andrew. Yeah, the, um, that's a great question. So that it is a two part um, problem. We have the issue of homelessness um, that continues to rise in the Richmond district. And obviously, it's been a problem throughout in the city of San Francisco for several years now. Um, we spent upwards of $300 million on this crisis, and we still don't get anywhere. So our approach needs to change. And specifically, when you look at homelessness, the answer is not building uh, navigation centers in Richmond District because one, they cost up to $70,000 um, a person um, to house in a navigation center and hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to build. Um, the, one of the things we have to do is we, we, do have to, we, we do have to get tough and realistic and we need to first and foremost get the, get the unhoused individuals um, and again, we can't treat them as a monolith because we have homeless veterans, we have we have young people, we have we have uh, young people within the LGBTQ community um, that are unfortunately unhoused, and so we have to treat everything on a case by case basis. Um, thank you, so... Andrew. Sorry, time is okay. Sorry. Um, thank you for your response. Uh, we'll now move on to the next question, um, which is, according to San Francisco police statistics, crimes against persons have decreased, but burglaries and car break-ins have significantly increased, which can lead to fear and distrust. What actions do you propose for residents, the police, and city administration do to handle the increase in property crimes? We'll start with Connie. Um, from my experience uh, working at both, uh, starting out as a community organizer for San Francisco SAFE and my experience working at the district attorney's office, I think property crime is, um, in terms of the crime pyramid, in term, it really does impact a lot of people. And from my experience is that, you know, there are ways and, you know, technology and that is not invasive and without involving law enforcement directly that our residents can use to either prevent it, uh, to prevent the property crime or deter and uh, from, from deter it from happening again. And I think that another part of it that we can make it more efficient is really about crime reporting, property crime reporting that is a lot more convenient uh, for the victims of property crime so that it also that data can be uh, provided to our laws law enforcement in real time when they can track it and hopefully come up with a strategy to either prevent it or be able to um, reduce in certain areas thank you connie uh, next we'll have andrew same question um, okay, so obviously we all know um, that violent crime is down across the city, but we do see an, a, a rise in property crime and theft in the neighborhood. So one of the things we can do is reallocate, reallocate funding for the uh, police um, towards uh, other programs because in our district we, ha we have a shortage of police, our police are stretched. And it can't be on the backs of our neighbors and our citizens here in Richmond District to do it themselves. Uh, so we do need to provide more funding for our police um, where they can come and be able to provide the type of security foot patrol in our neighborhoods to make sure these things aren't happening um, because it affects all of us. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, next we'll have David. Um, I believe non-evasive um, surveillance uh, and uh, uh, technology can be a great ally in our efforts to curb uh, the increase in uh, property crime. I think that uh, increasingly what we're seeing is um, even the automobiles that people are having uh, uh, monitoring go, uh, in their park vehicles. Um, I think that uh, we need, you know, police uh, uh, resources are scarce. I served on the Richmond Community 
police advisory board for a number of years. Uh, and we only have uh, so many police uh, and a very large geographical area for them to uh, patrol. So it's gonna be incumbent on all of us to work together to bring down property crime. I think the reporting is another very important piece. Uh, we should make uh, reporting of property crimes much easier and much more consistent so that that information data could be used and shared. Uh, I think also that we could be doing a lot more uh, as a neighborhood. Thank you, David. Um, next question for the remaining three candidates. Many residents are concerned about the impact of crime and homelessness on the quality of life in the city. What will you do to ensure that all residents feel safe in their neighborhoods while also addressing racial justice and law enforcement concerns? We'll start with Marjan. So I always say that public safety and police accountability are both core responsibilities of local government. You can't, not only can't you play one off the other, but you shouldn't, you can do both. That's why I support investing in our black community, ensuring that with the way we look at law enforcement and the way we look at restorative justice, that there is equity, right? However, we can't deny that crime is going up in our neighborhood. In the past 24 hours, pedestrian was hit on 9th and Clement. Three hours ago, someone was stabbed five blocks away from my house and this morning, a neighbor who has a public bench and a fairy garden on the corner, it was completely vandalized. And that's really heartbreaking for our neighborhood. Um, I think that police need to solve crimes. We can't cut academy classes. We shouldn't be laying off police officers. At the same time, we can invest in our underserved communities to ensure that we are um, equitable in how we're building for their future. So they aren't mutually exclusive. Thank you, Marjan. Uh, next, we'll have Veronica. You know, I, I just went to Safeway about two hours ago and right at La Playa and by the right in front of the beach, we have now a new encampment. You know, they moved from, they seem to have moved from uh, Gary down to Ocean Beach. The reality is we have to start treating this with urgency. We can't just move our unhoused population from corner to corner, district to district. It does affect quality of life. The reality is our kids shouldn't have to walk to Ocean Beach and see someone urinating on the corner. It's unacceptable. But at the same time, we have to see that we have to treat this issue with compassion and we have to invest in mental health services. I do agree, we need more data so we get appropriate funding. We do absolutely have to reinvest in our community and shift away from heavy policing. But there is a role for police to play in our community. Property crime is hot up. The crime against individuals is low because people are staying home, but that doesn't mean it's gone. So there is a role for everyone to play in our community. Thank you, Veronica. And finally, we'll have Sherman. The short answer to your question is we have to enforce the laws. The, we, the reason we have laws on the books in San Francisco is to keep everybody who lives here safe. Uh, as supervisor, I want those laws enforced. Uh, not necessarily to punish people, but we need to enforce the laws so we get people into the systems, we know what's going on, and that maybe we can do diversion or figure out uh, some other option. It doesn't mean enforcing the laws means putting people in jail. It might, need, it might be some other form of uh, um, compensation. Uh, but we have to enforce the laws. Otherwise, everything starts to fall apart as we can see what's being happening in the neighborhood. Uh, that being said, you know, the police department has problems. I understand that, but the solution is not to uh, reduce their budget or to defund them or to uh, reduce the, the numbers that we have. We actually need more officers on the street, more officers on the street deters crime in the first place. And that's really what we want. We want the crime to be deterred before it happens. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. Now we are going to move on to a quick lightning round. So please answer these questions with only yes, no, or no response. And the questions will go to all candidates. Um, and I'll tell you who will speak first. So for the first question in the lightning round, do you support the San Francisco School Board decision to remove the murals at George Washington High School from public view? Connie? Yes. Sherman? No. Andrew? Um, I would say, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say no. Marjan? No. David? Yes. 
Veronica. Oh, as an alumni, I won't answer. Okay. Uh, next question, still the lightning round. So yes, no, or no response answers. Is the current legislation on home sharing and short-term rentals acceptable or should more restrictions be in place? Sherman. No, more restrictions. Andrew. Um, no, and there needs to be more restrictions. Marjan. Um, I think mm, there could be more restrictions, but um, it's pretty strict. So I guess that is whatever that answer is. <laughs> David? No. <laughs> no, there could be more restrictions. Veronica? No, there's plenty of restrictions already. Connie? We need more restriction. All right, third question, still lightning round. Do you support the extension of BART or Muni via subway to the outer Richmond? Andrew? Um, no, because the last thing was a disaster on Vanna. Just yes, no or response, please. Oh, okay. John. <laughs> No. Uh, sure, if there's money, but I, <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, no, no response. David? Yes. Veronica? Yes. Connie? Yes. And Sherman? No, we don't have the money. Uh, next question um, for the lightning round. Do you support Prop, Prop B, which would split off public works, street cleaning, sidewalk maintenance, and sanitation duties into a new agency while the current department continues to handle engineering, design, project management, and other work tied to San Francisco's public infrastructure? Marjan. I'm sorry, my internet, could you repeat uh, that? that was... <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so this is still a lightning round, so yes, no, no response. Do you support Prop B, which would split off public work, street cleaning, sidewalk maintenance, and sanitation duties into a new agency while the current department continues to handle engineering, design, project management, and other work tied to San Francisco's public infrastructure? Yes. David? No. Veronica? No. Connie? Yes. Sherman? No. Andrew? Yes. Okay. Uh, next question in the lightning round. Will you commit to providing your District 1 constituents with rapid, easy, and responsive methods of communicating with you? David? Yes. Veronica? Yes. Connie? Of course, yes. Sherman? Absolutely, yes. Andrew? 100% yes. Marjan? Yes. Okay, uh, sixth question and final question in the lightning round before we go back to the other format. In general, are you willing to increase taxes on tech companies in order to support infrastructure, environmental, and or job training projects? Veronica? Yes. Connie? Sure, but it's really about the billion dollars or, or million dollars and, and really the, what, what tax category they are. Okay, uh, yes, no, no response, please. Sherman? No. Andrew? No. Marjan? Um, no. David? No. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. We will now move on to the uh, other format where you're given one minute um, per question, and um, we'll do three candidates at a time. So, will you, what will you do to support District 1 businesses, especially minority owned businesses, as they struggle with the challenges of COVID 19, both now and in the future? Veronica? You know, this issue is very personal to me as a small business owner. And if we want to get through this economic pandemic that we're going through, we have to invest in small businesses. We have to assist them in making sure they survive this pandemic or it will change the dyna dynamics of our community. The reality is small businesses, you know, are the number one employers for women, the undocumented, for students. And if we lose that, we're going to have a lot more unemployed individuals here in San Francisco. So it is crucial to our economic recovery that we invest in supporting small businesses, making sure we provide grants, if not low interest loans, so that they can survive this pandemic. We're seeing this issue at Japantown right now, where tenants are going to look like they're going to get evicted and it's going to change the dynamic the culture of San Francisco. So if we want to maintain our small businesses, our diversity, 
we have to start reinvesting in our small businesses, especially those businesses of color. Thank you, Veronica. Next, we will have David. We need to make it easier uh, for small businesses to get permits, uh, streamline the process. We need to make um, uh, language accessibility a priority to make sure that all businesses have opportunity, uh, including ones owned by immigrants. There are many immigrant owners of small businesses that are not aware of the opportunities there are to apply for grants and loans and assistance. Uh, we also need to help um, small businesses uh, support them by providing more grants and loans um, so that they can uh, recover from the crisis. Uh, I also believe that uh, small businesses uh, need um, so, uh, help with uh, understanding the government regulations and the health code. Uh, the change that changes every uh, few weeks with the COVID-19 announcements and uh, as to what is open and what can't open. Um, and that requires outreach from the city, which isn't happening in multi-languages. And I would make that a priority. Thank you, David. Uh, next we'll have Marjan. It is too hard to start a business and continue to operate a business in San Francisco. I think we've seen in the pandemic, we're losing 10% of our businesses a month and thousands Bay Area wide. Uh, I think that we need to support measures like Proposition H, which is on the ballot this November, that will streamline the permitting process so you don't have minority-owned businesses paying rent on a space for four years to open an indoor dining establishment, which is happening here in the Richmond District. Uh, I think we need to make it more flexible for businesses to kind of reinvent the services they offer so that as they weather this pandemic and move into a new reality where they possibly can't have more people in the business, we can't penalize them for that. I think for the next several years, we're going to have to alleviate um, the fees that we're charging our businesses so it's not so confusing and not such a financial burden. And I think we need to work with Black-led organizations and BIPOC organizations to recruit business owners of color to come to our neighborhood. Thank you, Marjan. Uh, next question, which for the remaining three candidates, what will you address, how will you address the looming economic situation that may result when the current eviction moratorium expires? We'll start with Andrew. So regarding the eviction mor moratorium, I believe um, at the federal level that that is already passed and people are gonna be starting to get eviction notices from their landlords um, here in the city, potentially beginning of November. Um, the city definitely needs to step in and provide some sort of protections uh, for renters and folks and small folks that are leasing uh, homes for their families um, but again, that's something that's going to take a collective effort from the Board of Supervisors getting together and figuring out an economic plan where we can protect these people uh, with rent protection. At the same time, we also have to consider the fact um, that landlords do have mortgages to pay as well, and they're supporting their families. So it has to be an equitable uh, relationship. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll have Sherman. Yeah, it's, it's a very unfortunate situation that we're all in right now. Um, unfortunately, um, I don't know what a supervisor or the city government can do um, to stop that situation. Uh, if the business is not doing well and they can't afford the rent, um, you know, un unfortunately, you know, the landlord has a mortgage to pay and, uh, you know, what, what, what can they do? I, 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 it's a very catch-22. The only thing I could think of uh, would be that um, if the city uh, chips in and they say, okay, you know what, we will uh, allow the, the occupant to pay half the rent and then the property owner will get uh, a tax credit for the other portion of the rent on their property taxes. Uh, you know, it's, that's about the only thing I can see that city government can do uh, to help private businesses in this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. And uh, finally, we'll have Connie. Sorry, Leah. I just want to clarify, is this a commercial or residential eviction moratorium that we're talking about? Um, I think the question uh, doesn't specify. I think you can answer either way. Uh, yep, definitely. Um, I, for the current existing uh, eviction moratorium that was authored by Supervisor Dean Preston and the poor, approved by the Board of Supervisors, came in just in time for San Francisco tenants that were able to really implement a permanent 
eviction moratorium for those who are uh, not able to pay their rents due to the loss of income from pandemic or during the pandemic. Um, so I definitely support that we continue to push forward for that. But I also think that it is good that we continue to fund the le free legal representation and free legal counsel for tenants so that uh, in the case in the coming months that when they have to deal with landlords, not they actually have legal assistance. I do also support the expansion of commercial eviction moratorium, which recently expired on September 14. I think we need to continue to push forward with that. And I think that we need to consider how can we deal with that similarly, what we do with residential eviction moratorium. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, which is the R Richmond district has seen a burgeoning population of rats following the closure of Gary Boulevard restaurants and staff reductions at Golden Gate Park. How would you deal with this environmental issue along with increased trash at Ocean Beach, starting with David? Well, as supervisor, we have to hold DPW accountable. Uh, and I would uh, make sure that our health department is also held Account, accountable to, um, to alleviate uh, pests and um, garbage pickup, especially. Uh, it is a travesty that our uh, department head, uh, DPW, have been um, implicated in a scandal. Uh, I think that the, the board has not been doing its job by holding uh, the departments accountable, and that's why um, such scandals have been allowed to persist. Uh, I think it's really time for a supervisor uh, to come in and ask hard questions about uh, the department and um, what is being done for the Richmond District. Uh, the Richmond District has been ignored for too long by City Hall. And as supervisor, I will hold DPW, the health department, and other departments accountable for addressing uh, the problems that we have in our neighborhood, such as rats and garbage pickup. Thank you, David. Next, we'll have Connie. Um, I have learned this uh, during my time as a staff at the San Francisco Recreation and Park Department, and that is really about integrated pest management. And that is really finding ways to uh, do uh, rodent control uh, that is without poison and that there are methods that we can actually implement. And I think that what that means is we need to continue to invest. That is an environmental friendly way to do pest control and pest management, and that we need to continue expanding that program, not just for city departments, but also for our everyday residents and for our small businesses to provide resources and education and uh, that so that they can do that too. And of course, I think that uh, we just have that and it's one of my personal favorite activities to do with my son is beach cleanup. I think those are the everyday residents can participate and that's what we can do. And then again, you know, it is really about how do we uh, as a legislature to find policy solutions to do so. Thank you, Connie. And finally, for this question, we'll have Veronica. You know, again, these are one of the things small businesses, family owned businesses did in the city. They kept the streets clean. They actually pay for the rodent control and helped our city stay rodent free in our district. So again, we go back to, we have to support these small businesses get through this pandemic. The reality is the Richmond district, they, they took a lot of our trash cans with the, the campaign of what you bring in, you take back home has not worked. We need more garbage cans here in our district so that you know people have a place to throw their garbage. And yes, we need to hold DPW accountable to keeping our streets clean and making sure they pick up the city-owned trash. We need a better relationship with Recology so that they educate the public of how to use their free services of picking up their old furniture should they be moving so we don't see them in the corners of our street. But the reality is, you know, rodent is a public health issue and we need to treat it as that. So we need the city cleaned and we need to hold DPW accountable for that. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, moving on to the next question. Fulton Street often turns into a racetrack, especially in the late afternoon. What will you do to protect pedestrians and to make cycling safer in our district? Starting with Sherman. So the first thing, the first thing we need to do on Fulton and, and also all the other major corridors in the, in the district is we need to have time traffic lights on those streets. Uh, Fulton is one of those streets that does not have a, a, a lot of traffic lights and it lends itself uh, to people driving faster. 
uh, we should have time traffic lights all the way from Ocean Beach all the way out to Scanyon. Uh, and that's how we uh, take care of that problem. Uh, if we do that, it makes it safer for pedestrians and we can add uh, a bike lane even on, on Fulton. But it, the first thing that needs to be done is uh, the, the, that's where everything stems from is we have to have traffic lights at all of the intersections on Fulton, uh, including all the, other, all, all the other major corridors in, uh, in the district, Gary and California also. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. Next, Marjan. Uh, so I live eight houses down from Fulton, uh, so I certainly know what you're talking about. And, you know, that's our how we get to Golden Gate Park. Um, and who goes to the park, right? Kids, seniors, families, people walk in their dogs, right? And, and that's, it's really um, intimidating to cross Fulton. And when you're trying to teach kids traffic safety, you can't really do that on Fulton, right? The rules don't apply. And, you know, not even to get started on people running the um, stop signs on Cabrillo. So um, I do think that we, do, we need to um, uh, time traffic lights. Uh, I also think that, you know, especially that entrance on 43rd and Fulton to the park, it's totally nondescript. You can't tell if it's a sidewalk, a street or dirt. Um, you know, that's kind of a death trap there. I mean, we saw a toddler get hit there many years ago. Uh, but, you know, we're seeing it more and more now during the pandemic, especially when the streets are more clear, a lot of speeding, dangerous speeding um, down Fulton. And I think that time traffic lights are the way to go. Thank you, Marjan. And finally, for this question, we have Andrew. Yeah, so obviously, um, all the major corridors in the Richmond district, uh, we do need to have uh, more traffic lights. Uh, we probably, if we're able to do that, then we can reduce the amount of uh, pedestrians and bicyclists that are in danger of being hit by cars. Um, just on uh, 6th and Balboa, um, I remember talking to a small business owner there and the traffic stop sign there is not even visible. It's covered by trees. So we, we have to increase the visibility of our stop signs and we have to have time traffic lights in the area uh, on all the major corridors. That's the answer to this issue that we're having in our district. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, moving on to the next question. Considering that there may be a large budget shortfall, what will you do to make the San Francisco budget process more transparent? Starting with Connie. Um, just last year that Supervisor uh, Sandra Lee Fewer and Supervisor Norman Yee had a leg uh, legislation that really mandating that there are public and community uh, uh, events and gatherings and meetings before the budget goes to, uh, before the mayors announce her, uh, or mayor, any mayor announce their budget. So, uh, announce their budget. So I think that that is the critical piece of it that we actually need to continue and make sure that we have consistent, regular community meetings along the way that we hear from our communities about where they think and how they uh, how we should spend our budget. But I also think that it is about having the audits of city departments, how they are spending their money before we decide on a budget. Uh, while we do actually at the Board of Supervisors do these uh, hearings, except they're always jammed in this one month of June and it's very challenging. So I think we need to do it year round. Thank you, Connie. Next we'll have Andrew. Can you repeat the question, please? My, uh, my feed got kind of chopped up there, so I didn't quite really catch the question. Absolutely. Considering that there may be a large budget shortfall, what will you do to make the San Francisco budget process more transparent? Um, I think the first thing is just, yeah, the idea of transparency is that um, I, if I'm on the BOS Board of Supervisors for District 1, um, I want to have an understanding uh, from each of the different departments um, what we're spending and why we're spending it and be able to bring that information back to the community here so we can so they can understand where their money's going and then we can come to some sort of agreement in terms of how we should move forward um, on that particular budget because we are facing about a 2.1 billion dollar deficit going into 2021. Thank you, Andrew. Next we will have David. Um, look, I've talked to hundreds of voters in the last week uh, who've all told me that they don't trust what City Hall is saying about our budget. Uh, the, the budget deficit has ballooned. We yet, 
at the same time, the Board of Supervisors has increased salaries for city workers. The, at the same time, the Board of Supervisors have increased their own salaries by 12%, uh, yet they want to increase taxes on our voters. There's a bevy of taxes that they're asking voters to pass in order to uh, close the budget deficit, but they have not shown, City Hall has not shown that it can be fiscally responsible itself. And the leaders at the Board of Supervisors have not done so. So we do need more transparency. I oppose the uh, tax increases. I support accountability. I support uh, transparency. And I think as supervisor, I would call for hearings. Thank you, David. Moving on to the next question. San Francisco has a significant deficit in the upcoming budget, which due to COVID-19 will likely persist in the future. What specific policies will you champion to address the likely and current and future issues related to budget decisions? Starting with Marjan. So that question also folds into the last question you asked. I think that we do need more transparency and community engagement um, in how we look at the budget and how we determine the budget. Um, I think it's very important um, to acknowledge that there are many folks in our neighborhood who don't have time to go to City Hall and to be part of these budget decisions. It's not because they don't want to, it's not because they don't love the Richmond, it's because they are working, trying to raise families or running a business. And I think we really need to look at how we communicate, right? And, and how we become more relevant as government leaders to our constituency. Because as I always say, if we're not relevant to the constituents we serve, then that's not a failure on their part, that's a failure on our part. And I think that 100% applies to the budget and how we are reaching neighbors. And we need to really meet them where we are and be very transparent and open about the process and genuine about getting their input. And that doesn't mean community meetings during working hours. Thank you, Marjan. Uh, next, Veronica, same question. Absolutely, we need a genuine conversation with our constituency. The fact is a lot of those who take the time to go to City Hall and testify regarding the budget or any issue, they do so knowing that the decisions have already been made. That should not happen in a democracy and it is happening now. So truth be told, we need a district office here in the Richmond district. So it's easier for our residents, our business owners, those affected by the laws and decisions that are made at City Hall have access to their elected official. Of course, we need transparency and accountability and we have to hold every elected official and department head and department accountable for what is happening at City Hall and each department. And we have to reevaluate government spending and carefully collaborate budget cuts and it has to be done without hurting, you know, those who are already hurting, our low wage earners, our working families, those affected by COVID-19. So to start with, we needed to really, tough decisions are going to have to be made. And, oh, okay. I'm so sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you very much, Veronica. Next we have Sherman. So having transparency in budgets or anything in City Hall, uh, without a way to disseminate that information in our local area doesn't do any good. Uh, we do need to have a district office for the supervisor so that residents can come and we can have uh, ongoing discussions about what uh, what costs are on the city and uh, what, um, what our expenses are in the city. But more importantly, uh, what past legislation, I know this is not an easy topic for a lot of people to rehash things that have already been passed, but a lot of the measures that we have passed in the past uh, legislatively, either through the uh, Board of Supervisors or us as voters, add a lot of cost to government. And I think as supervisor, it'll be my responsibility to look at those issues, bring it back to uh, the neighborhood and say, hey, you know what, this is costing us X amount of money, is this really what we want to do with the limited resources that we have? And as supervisor, that is the way I would approach this. Thank you, Sherman. Um, so we are now going to go into our final question before we have closing statements. And this is going to be answered by all candidates. Um, so the final question is, if elected, you will serve for four years. In 2024, what do you want to be able to say was your single most significant accomplishment? Starting with Connie. That um, we have keep 
are tenants and homeowners on fixed income housed that our small business are able to stay open um, and, and that some more new ones were able to open too. Uh, and that the fact that our 38 Gary, um, hopefully at some point BRT, but at, probably in 2024, at least run better, you know, uh, and more reliable and safer. Um, and that uh, Golden Gate Park, um, and it's really able to make it safer for everyone, including the possibility of keeping JFK uh, car free and yet remain accessible to everybody uh, all across the city. I think those will be um, great and, and will be really some of my priorities in the coming um, years if and when elected as supervisor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie. Next we'll have Sherman. As supervisor in four years, what I want to see is number one, that the neighborhood is cleaner and safer. I want all those traffic lights and all those corridors in, and I want to see the streets clean. So when we walk out the door, we don't see trash on the street. A lot of the questions that we have discussed today, they get back down to those basic, that very basic thing, you know, are the streets clean? Are the responsibilities that City Hall is supposed to do are they being done? And I would tell you they, have, they are not being done. If you go out your door tomorrow and you see things that garbage on the street, uh, roads that are not paved, government has failed you. And I, I, I wanna change that in the next four years. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. Next we'll have Andrew. Um, in the next four years, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected uh, to the Board of Supervisors for uh, District 1, uh, my biggest priority is going to be uh, making sure that, all, that everybody in our community here in the Richmond District is safe in terms of um, hopefully we have a vaccine by, by then uh, where we can vaccinate um, all the people in the neighborhood, starting with our elderly and those with um, immunocompromised uh, systems. Uh, secondly, is obviously to make sure uh, all of our unhoused individuals do have a place to stay and that we're addressing the mental health crisis and the opioid crisis that's a continuing growing concern in the Richmond District. Uh, lastly, is obviously to make sure that we have affordable housing um, as well as fair market housing um, for all of our residents uh, here in the Richmond District. Thank you, Andrew. Next, we'll have Marjan. So overall, if I'm elected four years from now, I would, I would like to see, and I would like our neighbors to see and feel an improvement in their lives in the areas that are most important to them. That does mean safe, clean streets. That does mean that with regard to our unhoused residents that we've moved many into treatment. That does mean that we've created an environment where it's not an option for folks to be walking into Walgreens and clearing the shelves, um, which is not safe for anybody. Um, I would like to see more neighborhood engagement and regular input. You know, we get a lot of remarks about, oh, it must be campaign season. This is how I can tell because people are talking about these issues. Well, I don't think there should be a campaign season. I think we should be talking about these issues all the time with neighbors and coming together like we just did in my neighborhood summit last weekend to tackle these problems together because we won't be able to change them overnight. But in four years, I'd like to see a marked improvement in those issues. Thank you, Marjan. Next we'll have David. First stop the tax increases on the November ballot that hurt our middle class and small businesses in Richmond. Uh, second, um, get Gary BRT built. Um, we should be well into our way or completed by then. Uh, as supervisor, I will shepherd that project and make sure it happens. Uh, lay in the groundwork for BART to the Richmond, uh, which uh, $10 million has already been allocated for uh, planning and that we be fully engaged and supportive of that process. Uh, and then build affordable housing in those transit corridors that we've seen in um, other transit um, areas where BART has been successful, uh, such as uh, Coliseum Connect, uh, which has built 114 uh, units of uh, uh, affordable housing. So uh, as supervisor, that's what I would focus on. Thank you, David. Um, and finally, for this question, we'll have Veronica. I think if I'm fortunate enough to be elected in four years, but I first wanna see is that no one here in the Richmond feels like they were excluded from government process. 
that their supervisor was held accountable to them and only to them and not special interest or corporate America. Second, you know, to make sure that we held every city department accountable to do their jobs, which means making sure our streets are clean, making sure, you know, our unhoused population has become an issue during these four years and not only during the campaign season, making sure our streets are safer, you know, and slower for our children, making sure, first of all, making sure our kids' mental health that they're going through right now during this pandemic is in a long-term effect as they go back to school. I think in four years, what we want to see is more ethnic businesses here in the Richmond, safer streets, cleaner streets, and, you know, kids happier playing in the streets again. So in four years, that is what you can see if I'm elected. Thank you very much, Veronica. Now we are going to move into candidate closing statements. So we are going to do reverse alphabetical order um, and you will have one minute to give your closing statement. We'll start with Veronica. Again, thank you to the League of Women um, Voters for inviting all of us this evening, inviting us to your living rooms today. My name again is Veronica Shinzato and I'm a candidate for District 1. This race is very personal to me. As I mentioned, I live in a multi-generational home with my senior parents and I understand the issues our seniors are having with, you know, cuts in their health care, with issues of public safety. I also have a son who is 10 with a pre-existing condition, has not left home for, since the pandemic, maybe has left four times and understand the struggles of working families as they have to balance out working and paying their rent and educating their kids. I will bring a new voice to City Hall, a voice for small business owners as someone who's dealing with the crisis of small business and having to make the tough decision if I'm going to close or stay open. But I also, again, have 20 years of experience in local and state government. I'm a candidate that won't be held accountable to any special interest, but only to the voters of San Francisco and the residents of the Richmond District. So again, please visit my website, veronicashinzato.com. Thank you, Veronica. Next, we'll have Sherman. Thank you for uh, sharing your evening with us and trying to learn about where we stand on these issues. Um, you know, the most important thing um, as, uh, any elected official can do is give you faith that government is working in your interest. Um, so uh, if I'm your supervisor, I'm going to focus on those basic things, those things that we see every day when we go out our door. Are the streets clean? Is it safe to cross the street? Do we have those traffic lights in at all those intersections? Uh, are the garbage cans empty? Is there trash piling up on the corner? These things should not occur. Uh, they're a failure of government when they occur. If I'm elected your supervisor, I will focus on those things. There's a lot of big things, a lot of big issues that come up every four years that supervisors have to deal with. But we need to deal with these first. We need to give our neighbors faith that government is looking out for their interests. And I hope to do that as your next supervisor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sherman. Next, we'll have Marjan. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, you know, every four years, as I said, we have these conversations. And, you know, we're running political campaigns, so things undoubtedly turn political. But I think when it comes to this seat, you know, I think we sometimes forget that San Francisco is a city and county. We're, we're running for supervisor, but we're city council members. We are local representatives who need to really focus on the needs of our neighbors and delivering those, service that are, those services that are relevant to them. You know, we talked a lot tonight around homelessness, around keeping families and working people in San Francisco, around ensuring that neighbors not only feel safe, but are safe in their neighborhoods. And I think that's really going to require a supervisor who's gonna roll up their sleeves and work 24 seven to deliver for all neighbors, not just those who supported him or her in their campaign. So I'm committed to being that supervisor. I think we need to work hard every day, not just in this campaign, but beyond to come together as neighbors and ensure that we get through this pandemic as healthy as possible and really rebuild our businesses and ensure that we're keeping families and working people in San Francisco. Thank you, Marjan. Next we'll have David. We have a rare opportunity in District 1 in the Richmond District to elect a new supervisor. There isn't an incumbent running this year. Uh, and we've seen how the divisions within our city government have led to gridlock. Uh, either the mayor's camp or the progressives camp, uh, they seem to be fighting. And um, uh, 
with uh, the Richmond losing. Here's a chance to elect a supervisor who's independent, who has a people-powered campaign, yet has kept pace with the front runners through the, the donations of small donors, small San Francisco donors, and through the public finance program. I am an independent voice for the Richmond, and I will put the Richmond first. And that's why I'm running uh, to help the Richmond emerge from the pandemic stronger than before. Thank you, David. Next, we will have Connie. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us tonight. And from my year, uh, years of experience in City Hall, that I have learned a lot. I have learned, uh, you know, from shutting down the Marin's power plant in District 10, uh, organizing the early days of criminal justice reform, investing more than $500 million of uh, bonds and grants and funding in our park system and, you know, advocating for city, free city college uh, and all with all of those that I really hope to bring my experience and skills to the table to really help us to close the income gap that we're currently experiencing that threatening our tenants and homeowners to be evicted, our small business being displaced. And it's why that they are my priority that I will want to work to make sure that they will be housed and stay in their homes and that our small business stay open. Our workers can return work in a safer work environment and that we have a more bikeable and walkable Richmond. And if need be, that people can still drive safely. Thank you, Connie. And finally, we have Andrew. Uh, yeah, I want to start by thanking the uh, League of Women Voters of San Francisco for hosting this forum. Um, and allowing all of us uh, to be able to give our ideas on important topics affecting our district. Um, if I'm elected for BOS uh, for District 1, uh, I'm going to be focusing on a couple of things. First and foremost is making sure that we make it out of this pandemic and are in stronger position uh, to be successful. So that means making sure that all of our residents have access to a potential, to a potential vaccine um, when that when that when that happens um so that people can return to some sense of normalcy our elderly community our working moms and dads our low-income families um and then secondly i want to make sure um obviously that we keep our streets clean um that we continue that we continue to strive to help our unhoused populations find housing find mental health um find the mental health they need and uh, lastly would be to uh, to make sure that we're protecting our small business owners um, and helping to keep them in business as they continue to recover uh, from the loss uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic and the closures. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you Andrew. Um, so thank you on behalf of myself and the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. Our thanks to the candidates for participating this evening. And we'd like to also thank all of the attendees for taking the time to inform yourself about your choices on November 3rd. Please remember to register to vote if you haven't already registered and to urge others to register. If you've changed your name or if, you're, or if you've moved, you need to re-register to vote. And if you will be voting by mail this year, please be sure that your vote will count by ensuring that your ballot is mailed or dropped off at a polling place or voting center early. Thank you all for being here this evening.